Pony and welcome to the Brony Book Club episode 18. I know it's been uh, quite a while since we two actually months. got another episode. Uh, two months, really. Wow, okay. Uh, but we're back. Yay. Uh, part of the reason that it took so... i three months. For, really? Oh, man. I think it might be three months. That's kind of insane. Well, okay. Sorry to leave you without fanfic podcasting for so long. But, see, part of the reason it took so long was because we wanted to come back with a suitably epic... And I... Can, I, can I talk about the production history of this episode quickly? Sure. Because <laughs> I've prepared a little... This is So, right after the last episode, we were preparing, and it was like, yeah, so Sam's going to do the next episode, but then we ran into the holidays. For the holidays, I went to another state, and then after I went from the... Uh, I wasn't doing the state thing anymore, I was still uh, at my parents' house for a little bit, and as I believe we've talked about before, my internet at my parents' house is not suitable for podcasting. <laughs> So we got back from there, and, and Sam still didn't know what episode we were going to do. So I, I was patient, and we waited, and then he, we basically narrowed it down to doing an episode about OCs, and we're going to do that. Follow the questions, obviously, answer. Uh-huh. The problem, I haven't read, I hadn't read Follow the Questria, so we had to wait for me to read it. Now, it only took me two weeks to read it. Oh, yeah. Badass over here. No life. <laughs> um, I was about to say. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, um... Yeah, so I managed to finish pretty quick, but then we contacted K-Cat, and we had a problem. You notice K-Cat is not on this episode, and the problem being, she apparently does not actually have mic or Skype, so she couldn't really be on the episodes, but we did a text. Sam here did a text interview with her. Yep. So, that's all. And as such, I will be reading her responses when we come to the interview time. So, yeah, she is pretty awesome. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so, anyway... KCAT is cool, and yes, we are here for Fallout Equestria. Truly, I'd say a legendary enough uh, entry. It's about as legendary as it comes. Yeah, I, uh, I believe it's still the only uh, thick that, with the legendary tag on Equestria Daily, correct? Yeah, it's like it, it's the exact opposite of Cupcakes, which is the only fic which has a grimdark as fuck tag. Yeah, seriously. Though they do share the grimdark tag, but, you know, not quite to the same degree. I honestly <laughs> don't. Personally, I don't think... Fall the question deserves a grim dark tag, but that's just me. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, both are understandable. But in any case, the big thing about this is that yes, there is grim dark, but it's all for a purpose. It all heads towards one unified thematic bit of literary awesomeness that makes it one of the best things I've ever read in my life. So, truly, yeah. this is a great fic. Um, so, do you uh, wanna have the interview? Thing? So yes, the interview thing. Uh, we have, of course, our set of questions, which, which I asked, as well as a couple smaller side ones, so I will simply read her answers. I asked, which tags on a fanfic will make you interested in reading it, and which ones will make you avoid one? And the answer was, I like a lot of tags, but I think that one, I think the one that is probably most enticing is adventure. Who doesn't like a good adventure? An adventure has the special merit of not only being in harmony with the show itself, but also playing very well with other tags. I wouldn't say there are any tags that I avoid. The tags are just one element of what I look at when considering whether or not to read a story. Some might make me more cautious, and I would say the chief amongst those is sad. Sad is a lot like Grimdark. You can have elements of sad in an amazing story, and properly utilized, sad will make a story more compelling and poignant. But sad has to work in service of something else, and not just be there for its own sake. If a story is just sad, with no other point than being sad, then I won't read it. I'm sorry, but I don't read Friendship is Magic stories to make myself depressed. K Cat is a woman after, I believe, woman after my own. <laughs> yes, and though, though, for the record, Fallout Equestria made me pretty freaking sad, rap often, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, okay, a couple times. A couple times. Yeah. Um, so, next question what, Who are some of your favorite professional authors and how have they influenced your work? The answer. First and foremost, and I apologize to KCAT because I am not capable of pronouncing this correctly, J. Michael Straczynski. Whoa, wait, J. Michael Straczynski? Straczynski. Yes, I I should say it right. Am- <laughs> JMS is amazing. Okay, cool. So yeah, J. Michael Straczynski, a writer and producer who created what I consider one of the best stories of our generation, the television epic Babylon 5. I need to watch it. <laughs> JMS taught me the proper way to construct a massive arcing story with multiple interwoven subplots and character arcs. 
He was my teacher on how to best use some of my favorite literary devices, especially the Chekhov's gun. Oh, man, and Fallout Equestria was full of those. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to recommend books, not television, but if you have any love of science fiction and expert storytelling, I cannot recommend Babylon 5 strongly enough. The first season is slow and episodic, but don't let that dissuade you. Trust me, it will be worth the investment. Other favorite authors include S. Andrew Swan and Stephen King. S. Andrew Swan is the author of the Moreau series and a master at conspiracy stories. I learned a lot about how to write action sequences from his stories. As for Stephen King, I'll admit that I'm a fan of many of his earlier works, but haven't read much of anything from him since before he started the Dark Tower series. Still, he's definitely worth reading, especially for his amazing uses of metaphor and simile. Hmm. It's funny. She, she just bitches authors that I haven't read and really want to. Yeah. Because I still have not read a single book by King, and I still need to watch Babylon 5. Though I can't say on Straczynski, I will say uh, his comics are very good. Mm. He did a run on Spider-Man that is fantastic, with one exception. He sadly is the one who wrote One More Day, but I'm not going to hold that too uh. much against him. <laughs> uh, and he also has a comic called Bullet Points, which I really need to read. It's a really yeah. great, for, for want of a nail, alternate universe kind of story that uh, is very interesting. Mm. Well, that's good stuff. So then, next question being, how did you come up with the idea for Fallout Equestria? Uh, there's a comment, apparently that's a very familiar question, so, yeah. <laughs> um, We're unoriginal. Yeah, no, that's a good question. That's that's why it's so familiar. <laughs> the idea really started when I saw a picture called Fallout Pony Vegas by Dan Shive. It was a picture of Applejack fighting ghouls in a ponified version of the New Vegas setting, and it was beautifully done. I loved it, but I have to admit that one of my first thoughts was, no, even if the bombs fell the day after the season finale, there's no way a Fallout-style aftermath would develop within Applejack's lifetime. <laughs> Hold on, can I quickly... Did she say Dan Shive? Yes. He, that's the author of me and an uh, old person who was on the show, uh, Corey Williams, our favorite webcomic, Elgin Shive. He, that's, oh, my God! Oh, okay. <laughs> he does do a lot of funny side pictures that everyone likes on DeviantArt. But, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I'm nerding out at the moment. <laughs> Good. Um, so, continuing with the answer... Of course, I deeply love both Friendship is Magic and the Fallout games, so once that seed was planted, I started idly pondering what kind of timeline would make sense. The idea of the story grew out of those contemplations. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, my, one of my, my favorite webcomic author created one of my favorite fan fictions. I'm pretty or inspired. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I'll, I'll have to check out Dan Shive after this. Um, okay, so... What, the next question was, what do you feel is the best aspect of your fic? The answer, I'm going to totally cheat and say the fans. But in all honesty, that's my favorite part of Fallout Equestria. All the wonderful and amazing bronies who have been inspired by the story to make creations of their own, and the friendships that have formed in the FOE community. And truth be told, the story would never have been finished without their support and encouragement. Many of them went so far as to give extremely helpful, detailed feedback, and even reading commentaries for each chapter that only that not only helped me keep going, but helped me make the best possible story I could craft. So that's pretty cool. Definitely. Yeah. I Yeah, it is a very inspiring story. Yeah, and it, yes, it, it is a, that answer is a kind of cheating, but it's a good enough answer that I'm just going to be okay with that. <laughs> so then, <laughs> uh, one other question that I kind of added in here, and got a brief answer from, is how do you feel about the multiple fanfics that other authors have written based on Fallout Equestria? And the answer was, I so wish I had the time and energy to read them all, but I am deeply honored, and I hope they enjoy writing their stories as much as I enjoyed writing the original. Yay. And then the final question, what advice do you have for aspiring authors who want to write fanfiction but don't quite know how to get started? And the answer, ooh, that's a doozy. I have a lot of advice. In fact, in most interviews, I give seven bits of advice and then offer up links to more. However, I think the biggest and most unique bit of advice I can give is this. Before you write, whether you are writing the whole story or just a single chapter, take some time to plot out major themes, events, and other important notes you want in that story or chapter. Think of it like, play like playing connect the dots. Not only should you have a good idea of what the final picture will be, but you should also jot down on a notepad all the dots that you want to be sure to include. Then, when you start writing, begin at the first dot and work your way towards the second. Now, this may just be me, but personally, I find it's just as important to not have everything plotted out before you start writing. By playing Connect the Dots, you give yourself room for inspiration and creativity while you are actually writing. 
For me, if I had known everything I was going to write before I started typing, I would have gotten bored. By only knowing the key points to each chapter, the story became an adventure for me as well. I can completely and totally agree with both pieces of advice. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Um, That's some good stuff. I, in fact, what's odd is that both of those are kind of the point. Um, I know it's a weird tangential thing, but <laughs> uh, what makes Avatar The Last Airbender so fantastic uh. is they did have a series Bible when they started, but they also edited it constantly, taking in what people liked and did not like, what worked and what did not work from very early on, which ended up completely changing where it went in some ways, but also keeping the core of what the show was about. And that was awesome. And anyone who listens and to that, these podcasts knows that we will sing the praises of that masterpiece until... Every episode! <laughs> every episode. Yep. Good. Just one more episode. <laughs> Yay. That's all. Quite. So then, uh, those are the answers that we got from the author of Fallout Equestria. And so, um, unless there are some addendums to that... I believe nope. it's now time for emails, which now that I think about it, since I'm supposed to be hosting this, maybe I should have been given those, but I wasn't, oh, so it's Roy's turn. Uh, <laughs> the mailbox? Even if I'm not hosting, I'm still Mr. Mailbox. No. So, one uh, question from Facebook, our first ever Facebook question, so honored, uh, by our good friend Omar. And actually, who, uh, let, Omar. let me inject in and say the obvious thing, but state it more clearly. We have a Facebook page now, yay, like it. I, yep, that's Yeah. <laughs> Are, before I talk about your question, I noticed that you commented on there with this question, but you didn't like the page. Um, would like to take a seat? Oh. Right over here. Uh, Sam, would you get out your bat? Okay. Okay. No, seriously, <laughs> we would enjoy it if you liked our page. It'd be cool. Uh, but yeah, his question is, I have only one question for whoever will, whoever will be in the cast. How long did it take to read the whole thing? <laughs> Why'd you start? Okay. I, um... Well, see, Roy already mentioned how long it took for him. It's the, the, the issue being for me, I have a life. I, you know, I have, I have a degree <laughs> and a job and stuff. And I, I, I never would have guessed while I was still in school that I would have less time when I got out of school. But I think if you compare Roy and my schedules, you'll find that the opposite is true. <laughs> I Well, I would say it isn't that you have no – it's not that I have no life and you do. It's, I think it's moreover that uh, we spend our time differently. Oh, that's true, too. Yeah. Uh, because you're more into video games than I am, and I'm more equalized with everything. I haven't even had as much time to... I, I've played Nino Cooney and I'm like 25 hours in. So the you know what started. I mean. I wish I had more time. But yeah, no, I'm just messing around anyway. Point being, I had Fallout Equestria on my phone, on my smartphone, and I would just whip it out every time I had a little while to read something. Um, and it took me three or four months, probably, to get through the entire thing. I mean, for those of you... Now, for those of you listening who may somehow not be familiar with this, this is one of the absolute longest fan... Uh, uh, I'm trying to forget. Uh, whatever. It's one of the longest fan fictions ever written. And it is, in fact, a good few tens of thousands of words longer than War and Peace. So, mm-hmm. like, it's up there in one of the longest just things ever written. Um, probably, probably, like, in the top ten. There are some really crazy ones, but... Yeah, so it, it, it's insanely long, and so it took me a good long while to get through, whereas Roy... So two weeks! Because he's insane. <laughs> well, it's when I really... Can, like, I just finished... I watched all of Batman Beyond in a week and a half, so I do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I it took me two weeks, but honestly, if you really look at it, I probably only re- spent time reading it on half of those days, so it really kind of just took me a week. Oh, man, don't brag. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, honestly. It's because when I sit down to read Fault Equestria, I, and, and you, you know, just, I read three to four chapters a day if I'm reading it in all that day. And as Sam can attest, the chapters of Fault Equestria are insane. Oh, yes. They're the longest chapter. Okay, they're actually not the longest chapters. I know of like one or two other fics that have about as long chapters, if not longer. Yeah. But it's a rare occurrence to find anything even close. Well, point being there, oh man, I'm forgetting exactly, but what, like 45 chapters in a fic that, and you know what, I'm just going to look up the word count. They're anywhere, a chapter ranges in that series from anywhere to 10,000 to 20,000 words. Yeah. Which is crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. There are one shot shorter than that. Yeah. Um, Okay. The total word count of Fallout Equestria is 607,282 words, according to the Pony Fiction Archive. Um, so, yeah, that's with uh, 
including the afterword and a couple short, like an introduction and prologue and stuff, 49 chapters. So, yeah, I'm looking at some of these chapters are like 18,000 words, 50,000 words, 39 is 50, okay, point B. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Oh, one. man. That, that, was the, that was that chapter that would never have ended. I was sitting at school reading it, I was like, okay, I just need to finish this. this no, no, <laughs> this chapter doesn't end. Yeah, seriously, that was an intense chapter, too, man. Crazy stuff happens in this. All right. Next question. Uh, the rest of these will be from email. And remember, it's been like three months, so we've got a lot of emails. I'm only going to cover one email, in, if the one, from each person who sent one. So first off, we had one email from Sergio Ruiz. You don't remember him. He's the one who sent that letter that made us think he was French. He said, Le Fluttershy. Oh, right. Yes. That guy? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the, t the subject was, I'm not French. You just can't see the overrated light. And then a happy face. Uh, his email is, Dear TBBC, I guess that is the acronym for us. Okay. Uh, oh, that's fun. I, TBBC. I'll accept that. I love, oh, yeah. I love you. Don't feel abandoned by your semi-faithful not-French listener is here to cuddle you with fan mail. <laughs> I sadly don't have a spectacular Trixie, uh, Twixie fic, yet I've got my crosshairs living over a couple, but I can't help m mentioning Trixie x Pinecone. Trixie with a pine cone. Finally, uh, Sam, you should, like, submit to Fluttershy. Submit. Uh, yeah. Before I continue the rest of the email, uh, if people are wondering what he's talking about, uh, I had a challenge last episode, and uh, the challenge is still going because I'm disappointed. Uh, no one sent me in a single Twixie fanfic. Uh, the idea being... I would think you'd be that, excited. <laughs> uh, no one... The idea is, if people send me a Twixie fic, I will read it. Guaranteed. I will read and it. He and he hates Twixie. I will Twixie talk about it on the show. Because it's I, stupid. Because it is stupid. <laughs> um, and then, P.S. Challenge accepted to you, Sam. What? One Octavia vinyl fic with them only living together and no romance coming right out. Oh, okay. He's going to find... Because you mentioned you wanted to find one like that. He'll find it. Yeah, okay. I'm all for that. And then, P.S.S. Bon Bon fic coming right up. Anything else, Roy? Yes, I actually would like a Bon Bon fic. That'd be awesome. Oh, man. I should just ask this guy whenever I need to read up on fics for the upcoming episode themes. I know. And then, P.S.S.S. <laughs> You mean Riddler instead of the Puzzler when talking about Batman? Uh, Batman. Um, actually, when I was talking about that fic, the Puzzler is the name for the Riddler in that universe. Hmm. And then uh, Silver Bullet, our beautiful fan. I don't think we've talked about this. He sent us, uh, you might notice this episode, we have this great picture. Instead of just the library, with this desktop and like this little stuff on it, and it looks really cool. That's our great friend Silver Bullet, who might have earned the title of number one fan. Uh, not only because of that, but he sent us five emails in between episodes oh. and about four Facebook me um, uh, YouTube messages. I feel important so, and loved. I know, right? So, yeah, he's doing good. Uh, he was worried about us. Uh, didn't He was afraid we were giving up. Oh. Uh, and I was like, no, we're not giving up. We'll hold out hope. I just discovered the awesome world of pony fan fiction with this podcast. I'm not giving it up yet. It's too good. <laughs> All right, and then we have three emails from Cody Fett, our good friend. Mm. I can summarize them. Uh, he went, when he talks about Fall to Equestria, uh, his opinion is that he actually quit. At, uh, he dropped it. He dropped it at, uh, what is it, what was, uh, the second time they went to Ten Pony Tower. What? And his reason, I can't, I don't think this is a complaint, but it's definitely an observation of the thick, where it's far darker. Uh, it's a far darker universe than either, not, it's darker than Fallout is, in many, almost every way, yep. uh, it is darker than Fallout, and it, he says this, I, I kind of dispute this, he says it lacks the humor of uh, the Fallout universe that kind of makes up for its darkness usually, and it also doesn't have the, he says it doesn't have the same magic of, you know, My Little Pony, so it feels a very dark, empty universe, and, it, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and he it, said, it, it's a world that needs a hero, but didn't get one for 200 years. Um, I'm going to quickly address this. I do think that is an observation. I disagree with the whole Fallout thing. I think there are hints of the same kind of humor from the Fallout universe. The problem is, I think that it's even uh, it, like that series has always had very black humor, and this humor is even darker, if that's possible. Like, it's even more gallows humor, more, oh my gosh, why? But it's still, if you have the right sense of humor, it's still pretty funny. Um, yeah. And I would say that I can understand why you quit there. It is still an incredibly bleak place at that point in the fic. It does get brighter. Um, and I'm going to address that, that kind of idea more later on when we just talk about the fic. Yeah. 
Um, but the other thing, yeah, you mentioned that the world needs a hero to go on pure gears. That's debatable. It's implied that there have been other heroes, that there have been people who stood up to the That's actually a very important fact of the history for Homage's character. But yes, and what's and what's funny about that is that it's because of, it's implied that the, the, this place used to be better than it is right now. Like this is an up. This is this is like a peak at the beginning of the fic of how good the wasteland's been. Which wow, wow. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's what Cody Fett had to say. Mm. Uh, oh, and he had a question. I uh, wanted us to know what we thought about this, uh, about whether or not Equestria's long peace before the onset of the Great War was doomed to nuclear annihilation. And the idea being, uh, several characters bring up the idea that it couldn't, you know, after a certain point, the war couldn't, it, it was inevitable, it couldn't have been stopped. And he's wondering if Fluttershy did something different or if there had been more, uh, more attempts at peace between either nation, could it have been stopped? And I think this is an interesting question, and I would personally say yes. I think they could. It, it is something. It was not inevitable. It could have been stopped, but I think each side was kind of clouded by prejudice. It was clouded by their uh, their stereotyping of the other, and they each felt it was a very much a sunk cost fallacy. They each felt that they poured too many resources into this war to just end it with peace, yeah. or to just get some kind of let the other one win. And that is a very realistic thing that happened. Yeah. And I, but I still don't think it was inevitable. I would agree with that, especially considering how much the the backstory of the main six and how all that went down is there very specifically for the purpose of showing us all of the little missteps and mistakes and misunderstandings that led to the eventual, well, you know, mega spell, but what effectively was the nuclear holocaust. And it's it's very th those things are there specifically to make that point for i mean for for me at least that it's the, there were mistakes made and had those mistakes not been made it's possible that this stuff might not have happened but you know it did yeah. <laughs> oh yeah um and then i'm first to mention this really quickly uh, there's also a comment from cody fett on our announcement for our facebook page video when we talked i mentioned in there i was like yeah our next episode's gonna be on oc so he's like i think that's a great idea however that's a pretty big topic i mean he, yeah he needs more than one episode and i'm just here to tell you that will be getting more than that one episode. In fact, I've come to realize that a lot of the topics we've covered, I don't think we've really even brushed the surface of it, ultimately. So, OC is one of those topics that we're going eventually to do another episode on. Um, specifically, we're probably going to do another one on Dark, probably another one on Adventure. Uh, not sure about the other ones, but at least those ones, I am 100% sure we're going to have to talk about again. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and and um, since we're going to try out transition, Sam, would you like to do the transition? To the next section thing? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, we're talking about the theme next, which is fairly OC. broad. I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure. Well, that's what I was about to say. We're going to quantify that. Oh, okay. Uh, when we're talking about OCs in this episode, we're going to be talking about fix uh, with a lar like a large amount of the cast is OC. It, not, not necessarily the entire main cast, but most of oh, it. See, that would have been good for me to know before I went reading stuff. Okay. <laughs> or, well, try it. I didn't actually get much reading done, uh, and, but still. <laughs> but, it, yeah, it's... Well, if you have something to write anyway, we can still talk about it. But I'm yeah. saying the idea of writing a fic where you don't include the main cast as much. And, yeah, since we're going to be discussing that, I think it's a interesting way to take it. Yes. Because in that case, you're really just using uh, usually just the universe, occasionally just events from the main series... And then you're injecting your own character, which can be great, because if well written, OCs are like right. It's practically writing a completely different story. Yep. It's, uh, but on the other hand, you can have terribly written OCs. Yeah. You can have OCs that are Mary Sue's or just boring, or um, you know, just far too. Uh, maybe mid max would be the word. Well, see, and I think that's uh, kind of the ultimate, like the the major challenge, at least when it comes to writing OCs, is that. There's definitely something to be said for the challenge of taking the characters that are already established and portraying them in a way that's consistent but also fitting to your story, especially when you do a dark fic like this based on a show like Friendship is Magic. But with OCs, you have the problem of the fact that, you know, when, when you write a fic about Fluttershy, everyone reading already kind of is attached to her. You don't need to work all that hard to make her an interesting character as long as you can actually portray her correctly. Whereas with an OC you're inserting everyone into Friendship is Magic without any 
of the characters that they're actually connected to. Or, you know, if, if you do, then they're at least not the main characters. You need to do a lot of work to make these characters compelling enough. And you need oftentimes to, you need that to doesn't know happen. How to write. <laughs> Ultimately, it comes down to you need to know how to write characters. Yes. Which is hard. Mm-hmm. Honestly, characters are hard to write. And it ultimately comes down to you need to get base... You need to come up with base characteristics and more surface characteristics, I, I guess would, would be the easiest way. Yeah. You need to know how they look. You need to make it um, make it so when you're able to describe them, uh, uh, the reader will instantly be able to form it, some kind of image in their mind of that character, have a solid sense yep. of who they are, but still have enough underneath that to keep them coming and wanting to learn more. Which is, incidentally, exactly what Friendship is Magic did itself. Characters that have, you know, very base... Yeah, you know, outside of their looks and stuff, even they just have very base concepts behind them, these characteristics and tendencies. But then, as you see more and more episodes regarding them, you see how much deeper they are beyond those surface things. Which is really great. Indeed. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. See, that's the thing is, there's not much. It's it, as it, I, with that when we're talking about at least these kind of things. That is generally the when you're trying to do an entire OC cast. In fact, you know what it really reminds me of in a lot of ways? Uh, when you're doing something like that, where you have all these OCs, and they might interact with minor characters from the main show, that kind of thick, it feels kind of like a role-playing game. It feels kind of like you and your friends are in this established universe, and you might need a couple minor characters, but you're just your own characters in this world, yeah. almost. Which is why I've said multiple times now, after we follow the quest I need to do a Fallout RPG. That would be the most fun thing to run. <laughs> that would be enjoyable. Good stuff. And then, Death Claws everywhere! Oh, gosh. No. <laughs> I will not be part of that RPG. No, Death no. Claws. That'd be horrible. Yep. Death Claws. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Okay, then, well, on to more specific discussion, then. The fake itself. Oh. Now, um, uh, all, and, you know, for just for those of you who aren't familiar, Fallout Equestria is... Wait, wait, what is this... Fallout, of which you speak, oh. isn't... People might be wondering about that. Okay, that's true. Fallout is a classic video game series that's been around since the 90s. Well, now I wish I had the Wikipedia page up or something. But in, in, in any case, uh, you know, first two came out a good while ago, as well as a game called Fallout Tactics. Uh, the second one in particular is considered a bit of a classic. They were stories regarding a post-nuclear apocalypse and, um, or, yeah, an apocalyptic wasteland after a nuclear, you know what I mean? And uh, they generally involve the story of one character who, having grown up in a vault that people have been, you know, stuck in for the last few hundred years after the nuclear event, um, for one reason or another, is forced to emerge into the wasteland. And, uh, you know, the story is just all about that character trying to survive. It is very much a, a Western RPG. You know, you can build your character in any way that you want, even more so than a lot of things. Like, if you don't give your character enough intelligence points, they'll just speak in grunts. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very entertaining <laughs> idea. And, Can uh, I cut in really quick about another important thing about the universe? Uh, I think it's, you, what separates it from a lot of similar ideas out there is that what's interesting about the Fallout world is that it takes that idea. Uh, some younger people might not know this, and I'm young, so I'm, it's only because of my family I know about this idea, <laughs> that in the 50s, they had this idea of the future, and they had all these concepts, like the flying cars powered by nukes, and they're like, they had all these crazy ideas. And a lot of these aren't even just future ideas. They were working on a lot of this. Mm. And this, they had this idea of the future. And what Fallout does as a series is it takes that idea and goes, what if science actually worked that way? Mm. What if they could have done that? And that's why in the Fallout universe... Uh, they actually made cars powered by uh, nuclear reactors. They had uh, the soda Nuka Cola, which was an actual idea that was thrown around. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, uh, radioactive soda. That um, is the worst idea ever. <laughs> yeah, no, Nuka Cola is cola with radiation in it. Um, and yeah, just in general, the whole universe is: what if the fifties never ended? What if the fifties stretched to the two thousands and technology just got more and more advanced? But that oppressive non-individualist attitude that completely pervaded American culture at the time never went away. Hmm. What if the 60s never came? Um, and that's what makes, that's part of what gives it such a, I, you know, the music for the series is all from the 50s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, it's, and it's awesome. It's part of that and Three Dogs is why you listen to the radio. Yeah, seriously. Uh, yeah, 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 I didn't know that. That's pretty interesting. 
Oh, oh yeah, I, I love Fallout. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's good stuff. I still need. I played a bit of the first one and a bit of three, but yeah. In any case, uh, Fallout Three eventually came by, developed by Bethesda instead of the original Woo-hoo! developers, which you know, which led to a lot of people basically calling it Skyrim with guns. But of course, it is very er, sorry, uh, oh, sorry, Oblivion with guns because Skyrim wasn't out at the time. But it is very much its own unique. And, you know, it has a lot of the same basic ideas. You know, first person, free roaming, giant world, all that stuff. But it is very I still call much those its fight own thing. Words. What? I still, I still call people say that those are fighting words. <laughs> yeah. No. So just you know, be careful because Roy will. If you send an email and say something like that, then Roy will fly over to you and attack you in your sleep. It. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, Fallout. It's a very interesting, very well regarded classic series. And so Fallout Equestria. What it does is it effectively takes the concept of Fallout. It's worth noting, too, that Fallout has a very dystopian vision of what a post-apocalypse world would be like. I mean, you know, some post-apocalyptic ideas um, and stories have this idea that humanity will band together and the good side of humanity will show through, whereas things kind of like this and the Walking Dead universe, stuff like that, have more of this idea that humanity will turn on itself in an attempt simply to... You know, everyone is going to try and survive themselves, and it's going to turn into horrifically bad chaos. Um, Fallout definitely goes more towards that side, with, you know, these raiders that are just trying to everyone. And as previously mentioned, Fallout Equestria even goes a little further <laughs> in that direction sometimes. Um, so what we have here is the same basic idea as the stories of the games themselves. Uh, our main character, Little Pip, is, uh, you know, spent her entire Fallout. life in the vault, and then eventually a series of events involving a another main um, character from the book called Velvet Remedy um, requires, or rather inspires, Little Pip to escape from the vault and head out into the wasteland. Uh, and then adventure ensues. Yes, very much it does. Um, so it's very much inspired by the Fallout games. You know, if you've, if you've played any of them, even the little bit that I've played of them, you know, now and again I'd be going through and then realize, oh, hey, this little story arc that's going on is based on this other little story from Fallout, and that's cool. Um, some of the characters are, and it, it, it very much um, just takes the same basic concept as the game, but it puts it into Equestria. And also throughout the series of the fic, you get flashbacks to um, a few hundred years before, which is very soon after the show itself. So we actually, you know, the main six and other characters, even the um, Cutie Marker Satyrs, had a role in the development of this war that eventually led to its destruction. And um, it does a very good job with that. It doesn't it doesn't go grimdark in the sense of just kind of ignoring the fact that the world of the show is very peaceful. Rather, it uses the fact that everything was, you know, peaceful and no one ever had any problems or fought anyone or anything. Um as part of, you know, when it came down to this, a war with the zebras was not something that they, you know, they were not familiar with something like that. They weren't prepared for it. And so kind of a series of mistakes and other events is revealed throughout the course of the fic that eventually led up to the mega spells that provided this apocalypse. And so, yeah. Mr. Gronseth, my hand is raised. Okay. Well, then I will pick on you, or... Whatever. Say stuff. Say stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. So a couple things. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, yes, in general, I would say you can say Fallout Three, Fallout the Universe is very dystopian. It is very dark. But I think just like with Fallout Equestria, saying it's oh my god, all this darkness and stuff is really painting the wrong picture. I know some people don't even, oh, I agree don't with even that. know this about uh, Fallout Equestria, where they'll. Uh, you know, people go, oh, we'll follow the question once you get so far, you know, things brighten up. And yeah, they, they do. But that's not something my little pony added. That's how Fallout is. Right. It is, on the surface, this world with these raiders and the slavers and these horrible people walking around. But you also look and you find good people. You find people trying to make a difference. Not just the player character. You find some of, I think, uh, the contrast allows for some of the nicest, most... Uh, influential video game characters because those who are willing to fight the good fight in a world this dark makes them that better. Yeah. And that both series have that. Yeah. Uh, and I would also like to say in relationship to the game, you, you mentioned how uh, I noticed a lot of them. Um, I'll be making some snide references to a couple, but <laughs> uh, I'll say this. What I really liked what KCAD did and I really respect this, is she didn't just go, okay, well there's this question in the game, we're going to kind of put ponies in it. <laughs> she always managed to change it. And yep. I don't mean just a little. Like, really changed it. 
in a lot of ways they flipped. Um, I'm not going to say how it is, but the morality of the Brotherhood versus the Renegades of the Brotherhood in both series are reversed, hmm. which I think was a smart... I'm not going to say which, whose morality was good or bad in each series. That's up for you to decide. Um, we'll have more to discover. But I, I think the change they did in Fall Question makes a lot more sense. Hmm. Uh, makes it easier to root for certain characters that you're supposed to root for. Um, and then I'll just say there is a... I'm not going to name it. There is a village... The name is both in Fallout Equestria and Fallout 3. And it involves a very distasteful quality of humans yeah. that have been also in ponies. And it's completely reversed what happens. It's hilarious <laughs> to me. Um, but, yeah, and I think it's hilarious because I remember really dreading reading this. I think you can hear it, listen to the early episodes. Whenever it's brought up, I'm just like, oh, it sounds so dark and stuff. I was surprised how I didn't find it that dark, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, I think it's, for me, having read so much stuff in such a wide-ranging scale of, you know, black and white morality, black and gray, white and gray, black versus black kind of morality, anything like all the way everywhere on the, on the line of it. And because of that, I'm, you know, when I start something, I'm able to quickly understand where the morality is going to be. Mm. And this series is so black versus gray, you don't even know. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, the, the bad guys are really bad. And the good guys are good-ish a lot of the time. Uh, they make a lot of mistakes. Oh, yeah. And I could see that coming, and I could understand and accept that. I can understand if someone had never played a Fallout game and was not prepared, that it could scare the crap out of them. But for me, I was just more... Like, there are points that were, oh, no, this is dark. I'm, I'm <laughs> dreading this. Yeah. But most of the time, I was more just enjoying it, seeing where it would go. I understood it was going to tackle these questions of what is, you know, of morality of responsibility, of, you know, different virtues. I was expecting it, and so when it did, I was just enjoying how much they were dealing with that. Uh, and it, I love in every different moral crisis, uh, the, all the characters react in so many different ways, that you're always, you almost never root for the same character twice in the main cast, yeah. in the moral dilemmas. They'll always react in a way that makes perfect sense for that character, but for you, you'll be like, uh, I think I'm leaning towards this one, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, that's, and, that's, and that just shows how vindictive it is of, of Fallout itself, because uh, one of the series' most famous points is that you're able to solve missions in so many different ways, uh, ranging from good to bad to, uh, I don't know. Yep. Um, and yeah, that's just great about it. I'll, yeah. I'll let Sam talk a little bit more <laughs> while I to get, gather my points together a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, just that there is a lot of good stuff about this. And as a, I suppose, a bit of clarification on the point that led Roy to be talking about how dark it was, um, I do, I had also mentioned The Walking Dead, and I believe this about it as well. Um, it, it, it is dark, and it definitely takes a bit of a, I suppose, pessimistic idea as to how a lot of humanity is going to react to things, and the idea that it's going to be chaos rather than order brought out of tragedy. But Fallout Equestria uses darkness in exactly the right way that any and everything should it brings it, it brings in the darkness because when it comes down to it the darker things get the better light is there, there agreed yes there, there's no you know there's all oh, this is dark because darkness and evil and bad the entire thing is building up to an ending that i will not spoil of course but i no, will say I won't. it's obviously not entirely happy but it is light I was going to say, I was so expecting a completely different ending. Yeah. I, up until the last chapter, I was expecting such a different ending. <laughs> and maybe so, because it was mirroring Fallout 3's ending, which a lot of people don't like. I love um, in some ways. Well, that's good to hear, know, actually, I, because I, when you I, said I, that you were thinking it was going towards the same ending as Fallout 3, I was like, oh, well, now I know how Fallout 3 ends. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. okay. Uh, and, yeah, I was surprised that it didn't, and I was happy that it didn't. Uh, I was happy in the way it went. I'd like to see... I almost want to see more after the end kind of stuff. It's oh, yeah. so interesting. Well, I'm sure that uh, the other... Uh, the other almost thing. every other <laughs> fic I've seen in the, in the Fall of the Questor universe takes place before... Oh, really? Or during. I guess it would be kind of tough to continue that on. That'd be, that, that's some pretty big shoes to fill. <laughs> uh, I do like it because it's very much... Uh, it's one of my favorite kind of endings. It's And the Adventure Continues, you know? Okay. And that... Uh, it's one of my... 
I will I will not gush about how awesome a ending line that is for Justice League, but I'm not gonna. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I will say there are, for fans of Fallout, there are so many fun little references that you're going to love. Um, they have incorporated one from both series with Fluttershy being a tree and someone claiming that she actually became a tree early on. <laughs> which for those of you who played Fallout Three are going to laugh. Uh, and those of you who have her are going to go, I don't get what's wrong with that. Until you find out what actually happened to her, and then you're just going to cry and rage and be sad. Oh, no. Honestly, I think um, everyone d- uh, debates over who had the worst. Oh, yeah. Um, no, to, to be clear, I honestly say, the fates I, of the main six are almost all known and rarely happy. That's something you need to prepare yourself for. More often than not there will be at least one flashback involving one of the main six that will quite possibly bring the tears. So you know, I'd say for me it was uh, Rarity. Rarities is definitely up there. Pinkie Pie's hit me really hard, and well, for me, just horrifies me. Rarity's death wasn't... I know Rarity. Uh, Pinkie Pie's death isn't what got me. It was more of what happened to her before. In fact, her death was a little more of a hopeful note kind of crushed. Is this spoiler um, territory? No, no, it's not spoiler. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was it was still dark, but I'm just saying, yeah, it, it was, I found her life sadder than her death, and that was sad. Yeah, yeah, it was just the, yeah, it, I, I get that. In any case, okay. it was. Random, ra- random thought intense. about this here, <laughs> about so much. Um, the swears little pippy. <laughs> ever. I'm just saying, my, all, my, easily my favorite is. Solar flaring orgasms of Celestia. <laughs> that is the best swear. To the point of, where oh, a um, <clears throat> a very important and familiar character, very later on in it, actually refers to Pip as as something like she of the very creative swears or something like that. And little Pip realizing yeah. that this particular character had heard all of that was just so embarrassed. It was wonderful. <laughs> is the best. Um. Yeah, oh, yeah, the other thing is, I, I think I've talked about this. I kind of, I don't ever mention this on episode. Um, way before, I think it's before I started this podcast, I kind of got spoiled on a plot point to Fall of Equestria. However, it was the fate of one of the main six. I won't say well, who. I'll just say what it was. Oh, right. Yeah. I'll just say, but, but <clears throat> the way it was worded on TV tropes, because at the time I didn't think I was ever going to read it. So uh, the way it was worded on TV trips made me think it was one of the darkest, saddest. It was guaranteed for a while that I was never going to read it because I thought that sounded like the most dark, horrible fate of I've ever heard. And it ever. is pretty freaking bad still. No, no, now it is still pretty bad. However, compared to what I thought was happening, it is so much better. And I, I'm sad to say I laughed out loud during that scene. Simply because my brain could not stop making Wizard of Oz references. You're a horrible person. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> you got it. You're a horrible person for laughing in that scene, though. <laughs> How could you do that? I was so relieved I had to laugh. Yeah, okay. I imagine you come up with something so worse. I guess I can kind of understand that. Uh, but yeah, but honestly, in any case, the, the 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 overall point being, it uses darkness well. It gets dark. It gets really freaking dark. But it all is there because of light. And when those moments of light happen, it's like you know a breath of the absolute freshest air you've ever had after being held underwater for hours. It's absolutely just stunning when it happens. There are certain scenes that any and all Fallout Equestria readers will be thinking about when I say these things. Because they they really stick with you, and they're really great. Just these little moments of happiness that are I will, wonderful. I have two last points. Okay. All right. Uh, one is uh, K-Cat and Starlet People wondered what I thought about it, because I don't think I really... I think I've kind of alluded to it so far, but I like to say I freaking love Fault Equestria. I would, I, would, I would say I think it is the best fan fiction, at least pony fan fiction, maybe not overall. But at least pony fanfic I've ever read in my life. I would agree with that. And it would be, in, and it's probably one of the best stories. It's not one of my favorite, but I do love it. I do honestly, deeply love it, and I'm so glad I read it. Uh, I think Thank the you. reason I loved, I loved it so much, uh, indicates because I how fast I read it. Um, I gobbled it all up. 
And the other one thing I want to say is, I, so we're telling you, you had to bring it up. You brought up Walking Dead. What? Yes. I've realized that for Walking Dead, I personally, from what I've seen, it doesn't, the reason I don't like Walking Dead is I don't feel it brings enough, it's so dark and it has so much less light than even Fall of Equestria, and that the light is so few and far between that it's really hard to watch slash read. And the other problem is that way before I started it, I've read uh, World War Z, and I've read World War Z several times. It's, um, I'd probably say one of the best works of zombie fiction ever, in my opinion. And so it is so much a better thing of zombie fiction for me than uh, Walking Dead. And I know it's an odd comparison, but for me, I, I just kept thinking, man, I could be reading World War Z right now. And I know that's terrible and stuff, but I'm sorry. So for the record, I, need to play the game. I will I need to play never... The game ever stop bugging you until you play the game. And I will... I will play the game, okay. God damn it. And I will recommend to each and every one of you out here, this is kind of a tangent, because The Walking Dead has nothing to do with Fallout Equestria outside of just oh, one no. comparison I made, but the video game is one of the most emotionally impacting and just plain difficult inter works of interactive fiction you will ever play, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. I, I, I would like to remind readers that I study video games. I teach a high school class on them. This is coming from someone who knows what he's talking about. I don't usually play that card, but point being, play The Walking Dead by Telltale Games. It is incredible. So I'm sorry, I'm never going to be able to play that card. Just, you know, do that. Do it. Okay. So anyway, that, that is a uh, next, tangent. Moving on from so, that. Moving <laughs> on to the next area, I believe. Yes, um, I believe so. Uh, overall point of this last bit it! is amazing and we all love it so um oh gosh now we're on to updates now when it comes down to it, when it comes down to it uh roy get out of the way has more time than me and has kept up on these and some of my favorite fics have updated and i still haven't read them yet so i'm just gonna hand this over to him entirely take it away roy i'm gonna remind him of what he's missed oh and i, I will be taking notes if you hear my keyboard clacking that is taking All right, so, notes. quickly, uh, of Challenges and Kisses update, that's a uh, uh, full ship fic where it's, yeah, it's very much more friendship than shipping, honestly, of uh, Featherweight trying to get Scootaloo. And that, not only did it update, but it finished. And it, it finished so conclusively and so well. I am so impressed uh, with how the author, w I did not guess until near the end where it was going, and I was so angry when I realized, like, you tricked me, you son of a bitch! <laughs> I, I love it. It is definitely something you should go read. And I recommend it to anyone out there. And I would also say, I'm happy to find out that he's working on another one starring Dinky. So, that should be fun. Ooh, really? Dinky! <laughs> okay. uh, I don't know who Dinky will be shipped with, but it should be good. I'm personally a fan of Dinky and uh, Pipsqueak. But, you know, that's me. That's my work. Uh, i read some oh, cute pics about that. Dresden Philly's updated a couple times. Uh, my only question is, why doesn't that update every second? Uh, <laughs> I need more. It, I need to inject some more. Uh, let's see. Uh, Milo Chrono updated a couple times. <laughs> that one I have read, and I love it so much. And now I'm <laughs> caught up again, and Pav, do more. I need oh, yeah. more. Pav, more! No. Okay, so did you get what I talked to you about it last? We hadn't read it. Do you get how some people might be a little, what, with the who the rep types are? Kind of, except or that honestly, it's been long enough since I played the game that I don't remember exists. I like all the details about that quest in the first place, but yeah, I can see that. That's a, it, It's definitely kind of a strange choice. I think it works okay, though. I think it works well enough that I don't care. Yeah. It's still uh, just we'll, one of the best fix and one of the best adaptations I've ever read, so I'm, uh, you know... Quick, quick side note. Uh, because of an upcoming project episode thingy um, that we'll inv uh, we're not going to give too many details right now, but uh, our, our old friend Cavande is involved, and because I told him about what we we're going to be doing, he was like, "Oh, well, I haven't read a wolf. I haven't read my little crow now," and so he's now started reading it, and he's now said it. He's now thanking me because it's one of his favorite fics. Understandable. Uh, and he's like, "I was so happy they combined my favorite character of each series." <laughs> and apparently, that's uh, Frog and Rarity. <laughs> Good man. Yes. Good man. Um. Also, World Without Rainbows updated a couple of times. And I really and, need to read that. Wow. Um, the characterization of a certain villain was really good. Uh, it scared the crap out of me several times, and yeah, really good. I don't know what else to say with that. Um, oh, gosh. Let's see. How many chapters? I believe four chapters of My Little Changeling. Oh. Or five. I forgot that that updated. Oh, uh, yeah. It's updated about five forty thousand words, something like that. 
so get ready. But it's really good. It's really, really good. I'm awesome. enjoying every episode. That's good. Uh, it's going in great. I, it feels like another show to watch. Like it feels like it's another. It's a spinoff of My Little Pony, and that's what's amazing. Uh, I believe we've talked about this one. Third Times a Charm. That's the Rarity Rainbow Dash ship pick, which I'm still like. It has such a weird ship, but it works. Uh, that one is, and it's also an adventure. So yay. Uh, that's updated a couple times. Uh, I'm still really enjoying that one. Um, let me see. Oh, Octa- uh, Vinyl and Octavia University Day is updated. And that was a really good update. And it was that great kind of update where it's a calm before a storm, where it's beautiful. It makes it, it feels you full of warm fuzzies, but you also can see the hints that you know the next chapter, something that's going to wrench your heart is going to happen, and you're scared. I love that. Um, okay, yeah. Um. Some people remember our friend Coconut Swallow, who was on the show, uh, who wrote uh, a Trixie fic, Hostile Takeover. Ah, uh, yes. Very, actually, that was our last guest, now that I remember. Yeah, so I always forget yeah. the names, but I, I, I really liked that fic. That was good. Yeah, and now there's a sequel. It's only one chapter out, but it's uh, it's starting. It's called Fight the Power. What? Mine. And it's a comedy adventure. It's supposed to be Trixie's vacation and a soul-searching trip to Ponyville. Instead, she finds herself in a town full of crazy and thralled ponies, the result of Twilight becoming corrupted by a mysterious amulet. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> managing, to about escape, that. managing to escape conversion, she sets out to form a resistance movement. It's off to a great start. She already has Fluttershy. Yeah. So yeah, it's <laughs> turn Fluttershy. An entire town of enthralled ponies with, uh, with Twilight as the lead. Okay. It's pretty good for the first chapter, at least. It was awesome. And uh, I don't think you'd be surprised with the sheer number, because I always talk about how often this thing updates, but Hybrids, the sequel to Discordant, I think it literally updated about 15 to 20 chapters between episodes. So, uh, and I've been loving where it's going. The stuff with Changelings has been really interesting. Uh, in general, it's just been really great. I believe this is a fic that recently made me cry, and I was surprised how uh, that I did. Hmm. But yeah. Really like that thing. So, that is all the updates. That's all the updates there are. Okay. That was the axe reference. <laughs> no one... Yay. Okay, so... Okay, cool. So then, yeah, uh, moving on from that, we got some recommended fix for ponies. Now, I'm going to say something that I'm slightly ashamed of, considering, you know, we've been on break for like two or three months, but I did not get much pony fan fiction read. In all honesty, as much as I do love it, a lot of what ends up getting me inspired to really read is the fact that I need to be reading some fix to recommend for this show, because I have so much other crap going on. Um, but, yeah, so this will probably be mostly Roy's show again on that. So much for oh, me no. hosting this one, it's gone. Did you still, you, <laughs> I've still been the Sam for most of it. Yeah. So the so you're going, yeah! <laughs> you're back up there. <laughs> Yay. Yeah! Hooray. So, so then, um, the, the only, well, plus when it comes down to it, I was looking through and hoping, like, oh, man, I'm sure I've read plenty with OCs. No. No, yeah. I haven't. I have barely read anything with OCs. I mean, pretty much any of the human fics that I've read have OCs, but, you know, duh. Just, I, have I don't know if that even counts. For me to recommend, two of them I read right before we recorded. Wow. Okay. See, I, I didn't have the opportunity to read right before we recorded, Woo-hoo! or else I would have. My nephew comes over weekly to watch Avatar. And we watched the Boiling Rock today, so I would okay. like I I might have considered just like trying to read through whatever episode was going on, but it was the Boiling Rock. That episode. Yeah, that that doesn't happen. Um, so I'll, I'll just give the one I can think of, and it is one that I've mentioned before, and I don't. It might be kind of cheating, but Light of the Aperture, the sequel to Aperture in My Heart, oh. which I've recommended very highly, involves a character from Portal Two who. That's cheap. Kind of, yeah, it kind of is, but still, it's a different character. Space Chaser is a different character. Okay, from Space Chaser. It was before, and Space Chaser is awesome, and all uh, and all of the mayors love him. <laughs> Point oh, being, Dresden, Dresden gets more mayors. I'm just saying. Oh yeah, well, no, no doubt on that. But still, he's Dresden. Yeah. Even though he's only had three girlfriends throughout fourteen books. Oh so well. Awesome. Now I know that this doesn't work out. Sad day, but <laughs> no, I, I figured as much anyway. That happens and stuff like in series like that but in any case um it is kind of cheating but whatever they're fun quasi original characters and you know what sue me that's the closest i could come up with i need to read more now that we're doing this again i'll be reading more so roy how about you all right so like i said i got three uh the one i did not have to read for this episode is what i actually mentioned last episode but it was so long no one remembers it of course not 
uh, in a tavern down by the river by Lysis. That is the one where it is the only character who really isn't an OC is Trixie. And it's the story of Trixie trying to uh, get some money back together while staying in a tavern in Manhattan. Or Trottingham. I think it might be Trottingham. I think, I think it's Trottingham. Um, and yeah, all the other characters OC, and it's a really good uh, slice of life, life romance comedy kind of thing. It's really funny, really heartwarming, and actually keeps both Trixie in character. Has her like only slightly evolve as a character, but she's still incredibly likable. I was really surprised. Um, yeah, really like that one. The OCs are really well written. But more important than my other two, this one, um, Pagaliacci. I don't know really Italian, so I'm just going to call it Pagaliacci. <laughs> um, and it, by They Call Me Jub. Odd username. Oh. Um, before, uh, so this fic has a very interesting high concept, which is just Pinkie Pie is the Joker. Ah, oh, right. Yes, um, but basically, it seems to be that Manhattan is con- is considered the Gotham of Pony of uh, Equestria, and it is consi- it has an alternate universe tag, and it's implied that all of the main six are eventually going to be in this fic. So I'm excited to see all of the rest. But so far, most of the characters are OCs. Uh, the only one besides Pinkie Pie is there's one who's implied by her speech, and a couple references might actually be Gilda under a different name. But besides that. The main, for so far, the protagonist character and about three or four other characters have all been OCs uh, who are regulars. And um, there's also kind of an appearance by Derpy, but it's so, <laughs> oh my god, you won't even know. Um, what's, a couple important things about this one is, A, the name. I found this out in research for it. Uh, Pagliacci is a, um, a, an Italian play, and it's important. And the reason I thought, oh man, of course, it is a very dark, depressing play, and it opens, it opens up with a clown coming up on stage and talking about how empty and depressing life is. <laughs> Which I'm like, a fic about the Joker. <laughs> I don't have to oh. that. That's just perfect. <laughs> uh, but more importantly is, the Pinkie Pie Joker characterization thing, well, she's called the trickster, or the uh, prankster, the prankster, uh, yeah. not the Joker, but this fic has made me more tense and scared than any other I've ever written. And it can switch just, like, and that's why it's so, so it's such a perfect you know, Joker thing, is that it captures the Joker's ability for you to be kind of lighthearted and like, oh, this is nice, oh, I'm feeling kind of heartwarmed, and then a sentence later, be scared out of your mind that a character's about to die, and be assured 100% that she would totally do it. Huh. And sometimes she does and sometimes she doesn't. And that's what's so scary. And it perfectly captures the Joker's ability to, out of nowhere, make anything scary. Simply from, like, a single line. Uh, a good example is early on, she calls... The main character, his name is Pinstripe. Which is funny, because he's a zebra. Uh, and, of course, Pinky has to make fun of that. So, uh, they're talking, and she, eventually she's just like, Yeah, I like you, Stripes. And then... She grabs him by his neck and slams him against the carriage and starts choking him and goes, but if you don't stop, and then in the exact same tone of voice apparently, says that if he doesn't stop looking at her face like that in four seconds, she's going to kill him. And it's so fast. And so, oh God, oh God, what is even going on? And it's perfect. Uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, I'm a big Batman fan, too, so it also helps with that. It's been implied that Batman might, or an equivalent of Batman might exist. Uh, I can only hope that his ultimate ego is uh, Bruce Wayne. <laughs> uh, so there's that one. And then the other one I read, and this is another gem, uh, it's called Life is a Lemon by Blue Shift. Now, uh, this is a deceptive one. The only tag it has is Slice of Life. And the idea is uh, Lemon Dream is this pony... Um, as her name implies, her family runs a lemon orchard. And um, she believes that she's a lemon. She honestly completely believes that she's just a pony-shaped lemon. Uh. And so what's interesting for that is you expect, oh, yeah, slice of life, fun, wacky. No. It honestly deals with what happens when someone isn't just, you know, that deluded and weird and crazy, but starts forcing it on other people. Like, she made... No one in Ponyville is allowed to eat lemons or make lemon things or lemonade or anything because those are her family. How dare you? And 
she's such, and it's all from her viewpoint, from her first person. And so you feel so bad for her. Um, and you, at the same time, you, it's, you, you want her to stop so badly. And it cap, it really captures the feeling of knowing people who are like that. <laughs> uh, no, knowing someone that goddamn deluded and crazy. Um, so that's, that was, that part's really good. And then it goes to, it's finished. It's a, like, five, six chapter thing. Um, it goes to places, um, that while I was reading it wasn't too heavy, but once I finished... I don't think I've been that hit by a fic in a long time. Wow. Uh, and it's more to do with my life, you know, how I grew up and my family situation that it hit me like it did. Um, but it was, um, yeah, that was, I, I heavily recommend it. It's an excellent, excellent fic that you wouldn't expect it to be. Hmm. Sam? I, yeah, okay, cool. Moving right along. Yeah, moving right along. Um, and and this is one, fancy free. Yeah, and this is one where I just absolutely have nothing to say, but I usually don't have anything to say for this one anyway. Non pony six. I had to stretch to find anything. Yeah. Um, and I did find one. It's uh, an old favorite of mine. I don't think I've ever talked about it on the show. It's called Ditto Gary's Story by Polyhedron. It's a Pokemon fic where it takes place. I think it was written. Be- it's old. I mean, it was. I think it was written before Gold and Silver were even released. Um, oh. So, whoa, back in the early days of the internet, <laughs> and it follows the complete. You know, that's it. It's Gary's story, and it follows this completely other character. Not Gary Oak, but like that's a, that's an anime thing. Shut the hell up. <laughs> his name's his name's Green. God damn it. Um, in the games, at least. But so what happens is is it's about just these other characters who are from Pallet Town. It's implied to be years after the original Red version. Uh, there's nothing from the anime. It reminds me a lot of the Pokemon special manga, and then it takes stuff from the games and tries to put it in real life. See how realistically the explanations for those kind of things, how it would actually work. Uh, and it does a very good job of that. And all the characters pretty much are... Not even pretty much. I think it's like literally one or two characters who are not OCs. So, yeah, it's very well written. I really recommend it. Uh, too bad it's dead been dead for like 10 years oh. so that's interesting. Um, but yeah that's a really good one I highly recommend cool do, 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 do. okay awesome well in that case uh, unless there's something else to add that uh outro that wraps this up well yeah of course the outro is to be added but you know <laughs> you know how long it takes you the outro hey guys you should email us if you have any comments questions concerns critiques if you'd like to say how terrible we are, or if you'd like to offer some help. Or say how awesome we are. I mean, you know, like, critiquing is good, but I but wouldn't like to Nick, rule out that Bullet, possibility. Bullet Nick does that anyway. Oh. So, um, just email us at thebroniebookclub at yahoo.com. And also or, like our Facebook page and talk yes, to us on the, there. In the description right below, it's right below this video if you're watching on YouTube. Just scroll down a little bit. There's a, there's a link to our Facebook page, and you should totally like it. And if you don't, that means you're lazy. Too lazy it to does, move a mouse. Absolutely. I mean, come on now. I, all right. Thank you, everyone. It's so great to be back. Yes, it is. I'm going Next to enjoy week, being back very much. We're having a special surprise. Very much so. Wait, do I know what that okay. surprise is? Uh, you should. Well, I'll t- if you don't, I'll mm. tell you afterwards. We shall talk about it. And you shall right. know until next week. So then, Sayonara, bye-bye. goodbye, every pony. Have a good bye. week. Children, this has been Free Dog. <laughs> Bringing you the truth, no matter how bad. They shot out by some raiders. You know they're making it hard for me. And-